Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first day of class. Uh, we're going to be starting out this class by going over what I think is one of the more easily understandable Asian philosophies, which is known as Confucianism. That is the teachings of the historical figure known as Kung Fu Se, uh, Confucius, and his disciples. So the structure of this class is basically going to be as follows. I'm going to give you uh, an introduction to the historical figure, the history of this perspective or religion, whatever you want to call it, and a little overview of the primary text that we're going to be looking at for this Asian philosophy. Then, next week what I'm going to do is we're actually going to investigate that primary source material. So, I'm going to ask you to do a few readings, watch a few videos, and that should... Uh, hopefully help prepare you for some of the main ideas that we're going to be discussing in these Asian philosophies. First, we're going to start out with Confucianism, which is, as I noticed, uh, noted before, uh, one of the more easily understandable, I think, Asian philosophies, because it, is, because it is more a social political theory than it is a metaphysical doctrine about the nature of the cosmos. Okay, well, let's begin. First, I'm going to start off by giving you a little bit of history regarding uh, where this Asian philosophy developed, why, and the historical context surrounding it. Confucianism is an ancient Eastern philosophy that arose uh, around the same time that Taoism arose, which we're going to be looking at later in this class. Some people call it a philosophy of life, uh, some people call it a religion, it kind of depends on how seriously you take it and whether or not you engage in ancestor worship uh, or if you have a pantheon of gods that you pray to. Typically, however, uh, it has kind of been absorbed into East Asian culture as more a social political theory or philosophy of life than a religion uh, like, say, Christianity or Judaism. It originated in China, and it's based on the life and teachings of Confucius, or Kong Fu Se. Uh, he's also known as Master Kong in the writings that we're going to be looking at. And please pardon my pronunciation. Uh, Mandarin, Sanskrit, these aren't my first languages, uh, and I don't know them very well. Uh, I'm not a world expert. Uh, by any means in these Asian philosophies, but I do know enough, I think, to give you a broad overview and an exploration of these concepts. So just bear with me in this class as we go through these different things. Uh, an interesting thing to note about Confucianism historically is that as the Chinese state was developing uh, through the Warring States period, as we'll talk about here in a little bit, uh, Confucianism was actually used as one of the primary curricula uh, to teach Chinese students uh, how to engage in social rituals and social etiquette, and they were used as the curriculum for individuals who wanted to end up participating in government or state operations uh, for participating in the state bureaucracy, official politics. So Confucianism is an ancient Eastern Chinese philosophy that goes back before the birth of Christ, and it's one that has definitely strongly influenced not only China, but also other parts of East Asia, like Korea and Japan, mixing with Buddhism and the other uh, cultural traditions and religions like Taoism. Uh, and it still holds a, a place in a lot of Asian inhabitants' hearts today, insofar as it structures their social practice and their political practice. Confucius was born, we think, in 551 BCE, and he was born on the cusp of a particularly interesting point in Chinese history known as the Warring States period. During this point in history, uh, there were a bunch of different provinces or states in China that were warring with one another. Uh, they were engaged in civil war with different warlords in these different regions, vying for control of wealth and the land. Previously, uh, China was actually run by the Zhou dynasty, uh, in which 
there was a time of peace and prosperity. But as that bureaucracy uh, kind of broke down a little bit, these different provinces started uh, waging war on, an, uh, on one another in order to engage in conquest and the acquisition of various uh, pieces of land and wealth. So Confucius was born on the cusp of this very chaotic uh, and politically and socially chaotic time in Chinese history, which obviously is going to influence the kind of teachings that he comes to and the beliefs that he comes to about what is going to allow for the smooth functioning of society moving forward and what kind of things we should be focusing on if we're trying to make a, a society harmonious where everybody gets along, they fulfill their social and political roles, and they develop good moral virtues. As I just noted, this time period came after the Zhou Dynasty, uh, which is a period of peace and prosperity and intellectual innovation. As we'll see as we read through one of the primary uh, texts of Confucianism, the Analects, a lot of Confucius's ideas are based on what are called the Five Classics, which up until this point in Chinese history uh, formed the backbone of a lot of their different uh, curricula uh, and educational texts. During this Warring States period, on the cusp of which Confucius was born, uh, the Zhou Dynasty were rulers in name only. Uh, they didn't really have a tight grip on these different provinces. Whereas before, during the Zhou Dynasty period, uh, they could kind of rely on these uh, rural areas to follow imperial decrees and do what was right. We see kind of... Uh, a saturation or, or you might say uh, the growth of greed and ambition and so it became harder for the state bureaucracy of China the country bureaucracy to actually develop a good deal of control over what these different provinces were doing and on the different lives and actions of these warlords that popped up thus during this warring states period uh, power in China was actually split in these rural areas between various warlords who were fighting for supremacy, fighting for territory and power. This is the historical context in which Confucius was born, began teaching, and began giving advice to various courts uh, within China. He was trained, as I noted before, in the five classics, the one of them being the Book of Changes, uh, a central text that Chinese culture uh, depends on uh, and has uh, basically allowed to saturate their customs, values, and, and ways of life. Confucius himself was the descendant of an aristocratic clan uh, with ties to the Zhou dynasty, so he was somebody that actually had the opportunity to get an education, uh, to study these five classics, and because he was trained morally and intellectually, he did receive an education in these ways, that would allow him to kind of construct his own philosophy, his own way of life in response to this very chaotic time in which he was born and in which all of these different provinces uh, were having to deal with this violence and uncertainty and insecurity. During his lifetime, uh, he sought to gain the patronage of a feudal lord during his time, um, and he thought that the philosophy that he had come to understand and espouse uh, was one that could greatly help uh, the Chinese empire. So he sought to kind of get paid to teach it. Uh, he sought for one of these feudal lords to basically patronize him. Um, so that he could spend time uh, teaching his philosophy and hopefully uh, lifting up uh, the Chinese people and construct these more harmonious societies again that were more emblematic of what was going on during the Zhou dynasty. He did a lot of different things during his life, uh, one of them being traveling to various courts uh, kind of acting as a sage, giving advice to a lot of different local rulers on social, political, and economic matters. Again, Confucius was somebody who was uh, highly educated and very intelligent, and so he would have been a boon 
to these local rulers who are trying to figure out what to do in kind of these chaotic, uncertain times. Of course, we know from history that uh, the teachings of Confucius, as written down by his disciples, have survived. Uh, and nowadays, uh, they have come to deeply inform Chinese society, values, uh, and the values and, and ways of life of the surrounding regions of East Asia including Korea and Japan. What we see today is these cultures being infused with values and teachings, not only from Confucianism, but also from Buddhism and Taoism, which we're also going to look at later in this class. So I think that gives a good uh, history of Confucianism. Let's now jump into uh, some of the basic teachings of this philosophy of life, of what we might call this social political theory. You can call it a social political theory or a philosophy or philosophy of life or a lot of religion textbooks call it a religion. Uh, but basically, it's a philosophy that focuses on ritual, social custom, respect for one's elders being a really uh, central value to this way of life, and hierarchy. Uh, more specifically, the social roles that we ought to occupy during our lives and those that we ought to accept and properly embody to establish not only a harmonious inner life, but also a harmonious society with those around us. So I've written here that it's primarily viewed nowadays as a socio-political philosophy rather than a religion, because unlike religions like Christianity or Judaism or Hinduism, for example, uh, it lacks a clergy, sacred texts that are held up as divine as the word of God, like the Bible is for Christians, and a pantheon of gods that people tend to worship. Uh, there are some people who follow Confucianism that do engage in ancestor worship, um, that do see Confucius himself as a god, or uh, one who was immaculately conceived, like Jesus was immaculately conceived. Um but nowadays, uh, Confucianism tends to have saturated Chinese and East Asian society in a way that it is seen more as a given way of socially engaging with others rather than some sort of metaphysical, cosmological, religious view of uh, how the universe got started, with which gods preside over it, etc. So in this class, we are going to focus on the ritualistic and the social aspects of Confucianism, because I think those are the things that have kind of stood the test of time and most strongly pervade uh, Chinese and East Asian, East Asian culture. Excuse me. Three main themes run through Confucianism, and that is... Uh, philosophies of life or teachings related to education, family, and ritual practice. One thing that Confucianism came to believe uh, as he was being educated and then as he was uh, forming his own philosophy, which was then written down by his disciples, is that he saw that the administration of law and punishment uh, was not going to be a good solution to the chaos of his times. It's quite human to think that when you have a chaotic time, when you have a period in which people are breaking the law, there's violence, there's stealing, adultery, uh, lying, bloodshed, that in order to solve these problems, you should kind of crack down on the people and you should bring troops in to punish them and perhaps torture them or hold them to the confines of the law. Conf uh, Confucius didn't see uh, this as being a good long-term solution for the Chinese people. Instead, he stresses proper education and what is called moral self-cultivation uh, in order to make society more harmonious and to help people persevere during these chaotic times. Like Plato discusses in his famous work of Western philosophy, The Republic, uh, Confucius is going to say education is really key. We should start a child's education at home. Um, 
we should make sure that the parents and the other people in society model the correct values and the correct social behaviors. And as long as the child sees this, if they're taught to value the correct things, if they're taught to have respect for their elders, if they're taught to have reverence for their ancestors and the social customs and traditions of their time, they're going to naturally cultivate the proper dispositions and attitudes towards life, and they're naturally going to do the right thing. In some ways, Confucianism is very similar to uh, Aristotle's virtue theory, which was an ethical theory uh, that this ancient Greek philosopher put forward about cultivating the virtues, certain dispositions to react in a proper way to what life throws at you, and then act naturally, uh, doing good things without having to think too hard about it, such that you formed your character in a certain way that you're just naturally going to do the right thing, engage in the proper social ritual, ritual, etc. We see Confucius kind of advocating for something similar here. So here we can see a connection between uh, the ancient uh, Greek Western philosophies, ways of life, and ancient Eastern philosophies. They're kind of coming to the same conclusion um, if you look at a few different uh, strands of them. So Confucius is going to encourage that uh, what we should be doing if we want people to do the right things, think the right things, say the right things, be happy and cooperate with one another is we need to give them a proper education. We need to start them when they're young and we need to make sure that we actually follow the proper social etiquette, have manners, and that we model that for young children. For Confucius, uh, one of the central ideas of his philosophy of life is that we basically need to change our hearts so that we think, say, and do the proper things uh, when life throws weird situations at us. Another central idea within Confucianism is this idea that the structure of the government uh, should reflect the hierarchy of the family. This is something that is kind of off-putting to our Western years, uh, in which equality is something that is prized more highly above anything else. Right? We say in the United States that everybody's equal under the law or under God or whatever it is, that we're all on equal footing. That is not how Confucius viewed the ancient Chinese family or what Chinese government should be like. Rather, the family operated according to a certain hierarchy. Normally, the father was the head of the household, uh, his wife was right underneath him, and then there would be the children, right? So there's a certain hierarchy that Confucius thought should be followed within the family and within the government if we were going to establish a harmonious society. The parents are supposed to be in charge. That doesn't mean that they're supposed to be asses, right? They're supposed to take care of their children and look out for them and protect them. And in turn, the children are supposed to obey their parents, love their parents, respect them, and do what they say. This is the model of the family that uh, was kind of in vogue during this time. Uh, we still see remnants of this today uh, in Western culture, even, although it's a little, has taken on a little bit different flavor. The government also should kind of follow this pattern. Uh, we should not have a bunch of people in government who are on the same footing. Rather, the government should exist, uh, should be constituted by a hierarchy with people on different levels of social and political power and authority. The idea is that if each person accepts and plays their proper role, right? If I'm a son and if I play the proper role of a son and I obey my parents and I love and respect them, and if my parents play their proper roles and they take care of me and they love me and they look out after me, we're going to be able to establish a harmonious social situation. So, the smooth functioning of society, Confucius is going to say, is going to depend on people playing properly their traditional social, religious, and political roles. The parents rule and care for the children. 
The children obey and respect their parents. This latter idea being known in the literature as filial piety. It's a central value in Confucianism that those who are younger or who are children uh, respect their elders, respect the people who are in positions of power and authority over them, whether that be in the family or that be in matters of politics. So, Confucius really isn't uh, a progressive. He's relying on some of these uh, traditional social norms, and he's saying this is the way that it should be. You should kind of accept and occupy properly the social role that is assigned to you. And this includes also not only roles within the family and government, but within society generally, right? The blacksmith should be a good blacksmith. The good wheel maker should be a good wheel maker. The, the wheel maker is not over and above the emperor. The wheel maker bows first and lower to the emperor if they ever meet. This is kind of the idea that Confucianism is following. And so within the primary texts of Confucianism, five fundamental relationships uh, are sought to undergird human life. That of the father and the son, that of the husband and wife, that of the elder sibling and the younger sibling, and that of the elder friend and the younger friend, and finally that of ruler and subject. Following the previous slide, Confucius is going to say that social relationships should mirror how these relationships should work traditionally, and that we should accept and properly act out these roles. And our roles may switch depending on the social situation, though. For example, if you have somebody who uh, does have a uh, government position, who is in a position of power and authority, they might have people bowing to them, engaging in certain social etiquette uh, when they meet this government person in the court. But when that government person goes home to visit their parents, they bow low and they obey their parents and they show their parents respect. So Confucius is going to say we need to be cognizant of the various social roles that we occupy and we need to carry them out properly in order for all the different parts in society to mesh together and to function smoothly. If we have people trying to break out of these roles, disrespecting these roles, not operating according to the rules of these roles, we're going to have chaos in society. And so what Confucian and what Confucius is advocating for here is kind of a return to order in on the cusp of the chaotic times into which he was born. He saw uh, the return of security and order and safety in society to carrying out these rules and roles properly. You can see now why this religion or this philosophy of Confucianism is often framed as a social and political theory because it has so much to say about how we ought to behave in society and in our social relationships. In addition to this, uh, and this is something that actually unites Confucianism and Aristotle's virtue theory that I mentioned earlier, Confucius is going to encourage individuals to cultivate moral values like wisdom, knowing what a situation is and what it calls for, sincerity, uh, being authentic and reverent in your relationships and your rituals, justice, uh, knowing what is right and fair and following through on those things, loyalty, uh, existing in right relationship to those that you owe different social, moral, or political obligations to, trustworthiness, uh, being someone that uh, speaks the truth, that is honest with others, that other people can rely on. Honesty goes right along with that. Especially the moral value of humaneness. This is perhaps the most important uh, moral value that Confucius advocates for people to cultivate. Humaneness uh, basically means empathy, projecting yourself as someone else, as being in their shoes, understanding life from their perspective. If you can do this, then you know uh, how you ought to engage with someone socially. 
For example, let's say uh, you have uh, the emperor of China and you have a lay person. The emperor is going to be a good emperor insofar as they can put themselves in the shoes of their subjects. If they can understand what daily life is like for them, the different kinds of struggles that they go through how they might be uh, harmed by various social and economic policy. So humaneness is really central to Confucianism. And this is something that we're going to see in the Analects as well. Confucius advocates for us to better ourselves morally, psychologically, and socially. The goal is to become more pro-social people. People who are compassionate, respectful, empathetic, and just. The general idea that we see in Western philosophy and Christianity specifically that is related to this is the golden rule. The golden rule, remember, is treat other people as you yourself would like to be treated. If you can internalize that and if you can put yourself in other people's shoes, you're on the path to developing this humaneness that is central to Confucianism. Because as long as you can do that, if you can understand people's struggles, if you can empathize with them, you're going to show up properly in your relationships with them. And that's going to make sure, uh, ensure that society is functioning the proper way. Everybody gets what they deserve. Everybody's happy and secure. Another idea that is central to Confucianism is ritual. And this is a word that is kind of a little bit weird to our Western ears because we tend to frame it or interpret it as a religious thing. But Confucius is using this term in a broader way. When he says ritual, and when we read ritual in the Analects, we should interpret that as social and religious etiquette. Things like bowing, like shaking hands when you meet someone in our culture, right? This is a social ritual that we engage in. Or when you're in the classroom, when you're in the college classroom and you're sitting there uh, in your row or in your desk, you follow a certain social etiquette. You have certain manners, right? You don't get up on your desk and start dancing everywhere and shouting. No, you know that what's socially appropriate is for you to sit and listen and raise your hand if you want to speak, right? These are all social rituals that we engage in that undergird social life, that allow social life to be predictable, that allow us to feel secure in our social interactions with other people, right? When you go to the checkout, you don't just slam your groceries on the conveyor belt and command the cashier to uh, ring up your groceries, right? No, what's part of the social ritual is you say hi, and then they say hi, and then you say, oh, how are you doing today? And they say, good, how are you doing? And then you say, good, right? These are all social rituals, okay? So don't think about ritual just in terms of uh, religious practices, like making a sacrifice in the temple or uh, engaging in the Lord's uh, Supper or baptism. Rather, ritual should be interpreted more broadly as something like etiquette. What do we do in our relationships with others? What kind of rules uh, do we follow to ensure that the interaction goes smoothly? So Confucianism is going to say ritual is really important. Ritual serves not only as the social glue that holds people together, but also is the social lubrication that keeps society functioning smoothly. Picture society as a giant machine of a bunch of different interlocking gears. You have the wheel maker doing their thing. You have the emperor doing their thing. You have the textile maker doing their thing. You have the farmer doing their thing. All of these people occupy different social roles, have different jobs and responsibilities, and society can only function as long as everybody is occupying their role properly, engaging in the proper social and religious rituals. So this is one of the things that Confucius is going to really emphasize for us. Ritual holds people together, makes uh, social interaction more predictable and secure, and it serves as a good model for those who are just being raised up in society. Children who see these different interactions happening according to certain rules will pick up on them unconsciously. They will learn to do these things as well. That They become conditioned into 
thinking and acting in a certain way that's going to keep all the pieces fitted and moving together harmoniously. So ritual is good for all of these reasons. It's going to be central to Confucianism. And we'll investigate this more later when we look at the Analects next week. In sum, if we wanted to put it all in a nice, neat little package, we can say Confucianism attempts to establish our, homo our a harmonious society through proper education, family values and hierarchy, and socialization into the proper manners and etiquette of social life. Learning the rituals properly, learning how to carry them out with reverence, the development of moral virtue. All of these things are central to Confucianism. Okay, so that is just kind of an overview of some of the general teachings that we're going to see as we explore this Asian perspective. I'd like now to talk about uh, the metaphysics of Confucianism which is something that we're going to discuss more in relation to the other Asian philosophies. But this will be a good little starter for us to kind of get our feet wet. In philosophy, metaphysics is the domain that studies how the universe works. What is all this crap? How does it fit together? What is this water bottle made of? Is it made of the same stuff that my mind is made of? What is the relationship between these things? What is time and space? How do time and space interact? What is energy? What is matter? These are things that fall within the domain of metaphysics. In relation to these Asian perspectives that we're looking at in this class, metaphysics is often going to take uh, the form of various creation stories, uh, what heaven is like, what earth is like, and what the relationships between these things are. If there are any gods, what gods there are, what their natures are like. Confucianism does not have uh, as strong and deep a metaphysical tradition as, say, uh, Hinduism, or you might even say Buddhism. It is an ancient Chinese philosophy, so it is going to uh, share some similarities with these views. Uh, one of them being this idea of yin and yang. This is something that we're going to investigate more uh, in Taoism, but as is represented by the symbol here, which I'm sure you've seen before, yin and yang is supposed to represent the polarity of existence. Just as lightness cannot exist without heaviness, uh, light cannot exist without dark. Soft cannot exist without hard. Basically, you can kind of conceive of yin and yang as being two forces or two principles that guide uh, the creation of things in the universe and their development through time. Thus, according to Confucianism and according to most Chinese religions like Taoism and perhaps Buddhism as well, the universe is being continually uh, created through this polarity, through these oppositional principles. This metaphysical view it lies in stark contrast to uh, other metaphysical views like those found within Christianity, which I'm sure we'll, we are familiar with. In Christianity, the universe is created out of nothing by a personal creator God. This is not how uh, Confucians, if they are metaphysical, understand how reality comes into being. Rather, creation is not a one-and-done thing. God doesn't just create the universe and then he's watching it unfold. Rather, creation is a continuous process that is being uh, supervised, isn't exactly the proper word, but is being guided by the polarity of yin and yang. So it's a little bit different from the Christian story. In addition, uh, if you have somebody who follows Confucianism, and they are more metaphysical, uh, they don't tend to view God as a personal agent uh, like Yahweh is viewed in Judaism or Christianity. 
God isn't so much a person in Confucianism as God is nature or the entirety of everything or more like a force. These are some of the primary differences between Eastern philosophies in general and Western religions. In general, the goal of Confucianism, speaking metaphysically, is to get the individual and society to cultivate moral values to become one with heaven. Uh, Tien. That is, getting society to mirror the divine order found within the starry heaven. So the idea is something like, there is a way that heaven is, this uh, transcendental uh, realm, we exist down here in this earthly material realm. What we want to do is we want to get stuff situated in this realm so that it is a reflection of how that realm operates. And if we can do that, we kind of participate in God's existence in some way. We become one with the divine. This is actually related to how Orthodox Christianity, I think, conceptualizes uh what our Christian journey is supposed to be, which they describe as theosis, becoming one with God. A similar idea uh, is here. We're trying to become one with heaven uh, through our own moral, psychological, and social uh, conditioning. We're trying to mirror the order uh, or the principles uh, how that transcendental realm is, we're trying to mirror that on earth. Thus, if we do that right, following Confucianism uh, is going to produce not only individual redemption, not only are we going to feel at peace, uh, are we going to act justly and righteously, but also if we can get a lot of people to do that, Social redemption is also going to come out of this uh, through participating in oneness with the divine, uh, Tien, uh, which is translated as the God of heaven. But again, God here is not conceptualized as like a personal agent who's watching over you and having a relationship with you. Rather, God is interpreted as all that there is and how that works. It's a little bit uh, more mystical. Uh, you can't really fit it in a box like you can some Christian or Western conceptions of God. Part of what this might involve, uh, mirror, mirroring the order in this transcendental realm, is ancestor worship. Uh, the worship of Confucius, possibly. Some uh, Confucians uh, worship Confucius as a god, as a divine being, although most of them uh, do not seem to. It might also revolve engaging in certain rituals which are designed to maintain harmony between heaven and our earthly realm. Um, but again, a lot of people don't practice or view Confucianism in this metaphysical way. Um, a lot of people tend to follow its values and its way of life insofar as it has social and political utility and because it's traditional not because they have a really strong foundational belief in the creation story and the metaphysical picture that Confucianism offers us, which it shares with other Eastern religions. Okay, now that that's out of the way, the last thing I want to do today is just give you a little inner overview of the primary uh, text that we're going to be looking at in this class that is going to investigate some of the main themes that we've been looking at today. Next week, um, I'm going to ask you to read sections from what are called the Analects. The Analects uh, is an anthology of passages uh, that are supposed to represent the words of Confucius and his disciples uh, and which also describe uh, Confucius's life uh, and his teachings and what he has come to believe throughout his life. It was collected together uh, by his disciples. Uh, we don't think that Confucius actually wrote any of this himself. It was actually written down by those who followed his teachings and listened to him and took his advice. And 
It was actually modified um, several different times over the centuries following his death. So we can understand it as presenting to us an evolving record of Confucius's teaching, uh, teachings and uh, the way uh, that he was represented to people during his time and after he died. Again, some of the views that we're going to be reading may have been subject to uh, development, uh, rewrites, uh, ideas coming from outside, being merged and mixed with some other intellectual ideas and traditions. It may not be entirely representative of what Confucius really believed and or said. In some sense, this doesn't really matter, though, because the values and the teachings found within the Analects undergird uh, East Asian society today uh, and are really strongly represented there. So even if they don't match up perfectly with what Confucius uh, believed or said, which we can't really know that much about anyway because he didn't really write stuff down, uh, we can still study this text knowing that it's going to give us a glimpse into how and why East Asian society has developed the way that it has and the values and customs that it has. So I'm excited to look at this text with you. We're not going to read the whole thing, uh, but I would encourage you that if you have any questions about any of the passages within there, uh, you know, just do some Google searches, watch some videos, and of course, uh, watch my lecture that I'm going to upload on it. Finally, I'd like to end on uh, just giving you some things to ponder in preparation for our next class, uh, in preparation for the next lecture that I'm going to upload on the Analex. I know I dumped a lot of information on you today. I know you're not going to remember all of it. That's okay. The purpose of engaging with this stuff in reading the text really is to think about it, to reflect on it, to talk about it with those close to you, your family and your friends, to figure out what it is that you believe, why, whether or not this fits in with your worldview, whether or not you want to adopt some of these values. So at the end of each one of these lectures, I'm going to leave you with a little slide like this, things to meditate on that should hopefully give you a few prompts, uh, things that you can think about and reflect on and talk about with your friends and family so that you come to a better understanding of this stuff and so that you flex your critical thinking muscles. First, how important do you think tradition, social ritual, and respect for your elders is for the functioning of society? We know that all of these things are important in Confucianism and they're seen as important values in a lot of Asian societies, but we don't really have the same views in the West, do we? We have a whole political party uh, devoted to uh, deconstructing the traditions and the traditional views of our history and of morality and of social justice, right? So you might want to think about whether or not you place a lot of value in tradition, whether or not you think there is any wisdom there, how much of your life uh, does depend on social ritual? What kind of social rituals do you engage in? And do you think it's important to have respect for your teachers, for your parents, for your grandparents? Well, think about that a little bit. Talk about that with your friends and family members. Likewise, what do you think about the hierarchical nature of Confucianism? In the United States, we say that we are all equal under the law, under God, we all have equal rights. We see each other as peers. Is this good? Is this bad? How would society be different if we engaged with others in a more hierarchical fashion? Is this something that we think is a desirable thing? Or do we want to maintain the equality that we have now? What are some pros and cons? of existing within a society that sees everybody as equal. Well, think about that a little bit. Finally, Confucianism urges acceptance of the social roles we occupy, such as son, daughter, sibling, student, cashier, whatever it is. 
What do you think about that? Are you somebody who is trying to break out of the social roles that you've been placed in? Why or why not? What are the pros and cons about accepting these various social roles? Do you think society would function more smoothly if you accepted your role as a cashier and acted like one in the cashier setting? Do you think your family would be happier if you weren't trying to one-up your parents as a son or a daughter? If you showed respect for your elder siblings, if you listen to them, what do you think about this idea that generally we should accept and occupy the social roles that we're given? All of these are very deep questions that I think uh, we could write whole books about. But hopefully this just gets your mind stirring a little bit to want you to investigate these themes a little bit more. And hopefully it prompts you to think about these things and figure out what it is that you believe. Okay. Well, that's all I have for you today. Uh, next week, I'm going to upload a lecture going through um, some of the first sections of the Analex. We're not going to go through the whole text, um, but I hope that uh, as we go through the Analex next week that you really chew on what Confucius is saying and that you think about it and that you get some wisdom from it. Okay. Thank you very much, and I will see you next time. Bye.